And who do we have on the line right now? Hello. Are you there, caller? Yeah, I'm here, caller. I'm, I'm here, main controller. And I'm calling into the main controller, the main man, the serviette, the human serviette. Thank you very much. And who are you, caller? Uh, I'm Mick Jones. Mick Jones from Carbon Silicon. Yeah, no, not the other one. Yeah. And also, Vancouver holds a lot of special memories for you, I think, Mick, because Vancouver was the site... It was the first ever gig that The Clash played in North America was in Vancouver. At the Commodore Ballroom, like your first exactly. out, of, out of Europe gig in North America, at least, was in Vancouver. So the first punks that you saw were the Vancouver yeah. punks. That was like 78, 79, wasn't it? It was like really like at least... 30 years ago now. It was like February 1979, and we have a caller. Caller, are you there? Yep. It's Ca Ev. Caller. Oh, hello, caller. Go ahead and speak up to Mick Jones. Hello? Hi, Mick. It's Hi, Bev right. Davies phoning. A bit louder if you could, caller. Hi. It's Bev Davies phoning, just saying hi. Sorry you didn't make it up here to the show. Us too, us too. Sorry we couldn't make it. We're going to come soon as Hopefully. Now, Mick, Bev took some photos of you when you played with The Clash in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada in 1982 at your last... Oh. Yes, and we were going to show these photos to you at the oh. gig as well. We tried to email them to you. I don't think you got them. Did you? Some photos? I'm not sure. It takes me a little while since I'm not the best person to do all that stuff. Bev, what can you being... tell... How can you describe the photos to Mick, Bev, that you took oh, right. years there's, ago? There's one of them. Um, there's one of them that I took at the US Festival in San Bernardino when you guys played there. And oh, okay, okay. That was our last, our last, my last ever gig, actually. Yes, with the Clash. You yeah. had a press conference um, in who knows the back field behind the stage um, yeah. before you guys went on. And it's yeah, well, that was a funny press conference because that was like we only knew about that a couple of minutes before the press did, and it was like our manager and no, no one, we none of us fancied doing a press conference just before we went on stage, <laughs> and so we were really fed up. And so what we did was, um, especially Joe was tremendously fed up, and he took hold of our manager at the time, and just got him by the scruff of the neck and said, "I'm not doing a press conference. You are." And he ah. just chucked him to the press wall. Well, that kind of explains this back picture, to the, too, because... Back to the rest of the press hounds, and then we went on stage. How would you describe... Over there. They were touring him apart from limb to limb, and we, we went on stage over his bits of bones. <laughs> that was our manager's last time we ever worked with him. Ah, that explains this picture, then, and you will get a copy of it, but it's got... Okay. In the background, I hope we can see the manager getting torn limb from limb. No, 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 actually not. <laughs> I had some restriction where I could be. <laughs> and, um, <there's... laughs> I couldn't see it. <laughs> I couldn't it see it, It did end no. in the punch-up, though, didn't it, if I remember correctly? Pardon? It was, because they went, the, the clash of El Leicester building, like, in the Elvis... The photo like <laughs> we went, no, we haven't. We're still here. And, there's and then the bouncers you... wouldn't let us on, and so we had scuffled at there's... the side of the stage for a little while. And then eventually we had our power of numbers overcame their power of numbers. And we ah. stormed back on stage for an encore. Yes. By then I was away across another lake heading to Look, my tent. That's because they told you that we'd left the building. That's yeah, why. I, I hate that. I thought you got on the helicopter and went back to the hotel. <laughs> and Bev, you also took photos of Mick when he played with The Clash, and we're speaking here to Mick Jones from Carbon Silicon. Bev also has some photos of you, Mick, when you played the Carisdale Arena. Right, Bev? Could you describe those photos? Because those are very interesting. Yeah, um, this, there's one here um, from June 26, 1982. And All right, do you know that's my birthday? Is if it? I might well, interject. That is really my birthday, seriously. Wow. Well, that there's a amazing. birthday picture of you then backstage at the Carisdale Arena, and all of you are in the dressing room standing, posing for me to come in. And your manager at the time made me sit outside um, the dressing room. Which, you know, which manager to... was this? It was much later after, yeah, obviously, after we had like, a kind of continual limb from limb. manager. The one we were talking about earlier is not, no longer with us. I'm just joking. But the manager <laughs> kept walking past, and you people were walking past, and I was told to sit there and wait. 
not to talk to anybody. So I was sitting and wow. waiting, sitting and waiting. And then he came by and he stood and he said, oh, you know, they don't like the press. And I said, you know well, what we didn't they... consider you the press, love. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I said, you <laughs> know what they'd be without the press? And he got all bristly. And I said, they'd be the greatest he got, he got band snippy, on earth. Did he? But no one would have ever heard of them. <laughs> and then <laughs> without he me... you guys. Then he, he said, know, okay, we you didn't can go consider in. you the press. We thought you were... It was a different uh, categorization for... For the, for the photographers, war photographers, we like to call them. <laughs> Bev, the evening continued on, and you took some more photos. Maybe you could describe to Mick Jones the photo you took of their tour bus. What do you remember particularly, particularly about that gig? I guess it was your birthday, Mick, in Vancouver. No, that was right, gig. yeah. I no, think I've got to work that out, which is exactly my birthday piece. I think it was my 17th or 18th. No, I'm just joking. Anyway, <laughs> but um, it was well, like I was 11 early on. I at can't the time, so. now because, uh, <laughs> Maybe 22. I don't know. And Bev, continuing on, it. some of the other photos you took, one of them is of a tour bus, right? Could you explain yeah, that? that? Was your very first tour that you came through Vancouver, where you first show at the Commodore. Didn't yes. see that. But your, the very last show you did on the same tour after you'd been all around, you did in Vancouver also. And right. I remember DOA, that too because I, everybody left me at Vancouver. DOA opened for you. I think. They've had enough of me. And I was going, help. Do you remember, Mick, some of the opening bands that opened for you? Because one of them on that particular tour, the very last gig was the rock and roll band DOA, the punk band DOA. Of from course, Vancouver. of course, yeah. Our hometown boys, and somebody wrote on your bus, on the mm -hmm. side of the bus. <laughs> well, that, that, it was Dolly Parton's bus originally, I think. So. Somebody spray-painted on the side of the bus, Clash Suck DOA Rule. There was some... <laughs> And Bev has a photo of this, and we were hoping to show this to you at the gig, all these little memories from Vancouver, British Columbia, then, Canada. What we did, we sprayed over the suck and DOA, and so it just said clash rule. Oh, very good. Good thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I sent Bev, and I also sent them to you, I guess the record company didn't get them to you, was a picture of you playing soccer in Vancouver. Like when you guys arrived in Vancouver for your very first gig, I think you arrived here a week early, and you ended up melding with the locals, and you played soccer with some of the local punks. We needed to get acclimatized, that's what it was. We thought, because it would be so high up, there's so much static electricity, we needed to get acclimatized before and, and now what a perfect way to become acclimatized and to play football and, and you play we used to play all the time in the old days it was part of our routine you know so we have a we play a bit of music go and have a game of football and then go and play some more music it was like part of it it was like a training also the kind of camaraderie of the team you know do you remember anything about that game? You guys won 5-3. You won that game 5-3. Yeah, we, we had some ringers, probably, on our, on our team. I wouldn't be surprised. Well, apparently Paul Simona played really dirty. Did he play really dirty? Like, all the people in Vancouver, all the punks are like, man, Paul exactly. really hurt some me. Of the, socials, the, 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 the finesse that you see in the, in the modern day player, I would agree with that, that's for sure. <laughs> We're going to try to get you those photos, too. How should we get you those photos? We've been trying to email them to you. How, how can we get them to you? Well, you can certainly email them to carbonsiliconinc.com, which is our own very own website, which has loads of really great stuff on it, uh, free music, uh, information about the band, where we're playing, and also um, a very active forum on all related subjects as well. Okay, we'll send them there. Well, thanks so much, Bev, and do do the loot do Quick. Thank quick. you so much. Love you to talk to you. All the best. See you soon. Oh. All the best. Love you. Don't hang up yet, though, Mick. I still have a few more questions for you. Oh, okay. bye. <laughs> um, bye. <laughs> and, and so, Mick, I was, what, I, we, what I was curious about was, do we have I a... I beg your pardon. No, I'm saying, I think we have another phone ca caller. Are you there? Hello? I am here. I'm... Uh, is that me? No, that's oh, no. no. I was just wondering Wait, if we had. Okay, caller. We, I think we had another Sorry. caller. Please phone back. And speaking of Mick Jones, Mick Jones, I was thinking of all the bands who've been Big Audio Dynamite, The Clash, etc. What was your first punk gig? But then I was thinking, you are punk. How can? How does that work? If you are punk, what is your how first? How does that work? How does that work? Well, I don't know how it works, but I think it's the same thing. Uh, like trying to stay true to the beliefs you always 
always had is probably how it works. But what was the I first punk band that you saw? Because you were the first punk band that you saw because you were punk. You know, like... Well, first band that I ever saw, I, I saw bands on television when I was, like, really young, like the Kinks and the Beatles and the Who and the Small Faces. Oh, I guess I meant by punk band. Stones. What about the punk? Like, when did you first see the Sex Pistols? Yeah, no, they used to be, like, well, very influential was um, Lenny Kay's Nuggets compilation, uh, Patti Smith's Horses, and the Ramones' first album. And then even before that, there would be the New York Dolls, the MC5 and the Stooges. Caller, are you there? I'm still here. And I'm right. you're oh, yes. To me. Caller, go ahead. Speak loudly to Mick Jones. Mick Jones and Nardo are human serviette. Hello. Hello. You guys, you've you, you never been to Poland to play in Poland, have you? No, amazingly not. I've got look, many Polish friends in, in Hammersmith, where I live, near where I oh. live. It has the biggest uh, Polish population in London, and that's like traditional since the like, Second World War or something. Right. And in fact, the pr coat of arms of Hammersmith has like the Polish, I don't know if it's a lion or whatever the Polish symbol is, as part of it. And funny enough, we're playing in a Polish hall tonight, because we're playing at the Irving Plaza, which is now called the Fillmore. And that used to be like an old Polish hall, and uh, yeah, it's all the, po the Bialystok and all that. The coats of arms of all the names of the Polish families around the walls of the old dressing room. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah, no, you know, I mean, I'm, because I'm with you, man. I love that. Yeah, because, you know, when, when, well. when we were playing in Poland, we are just, you know, copying you and all your songs. And saying, oh, we're coming, well, we're coming. I've got so many Polish friends. They keep saying, when are you coming? We're coming soon. We're yeah, coming you know, I'm not calling. I'm not calling. An airdrop. Okay, well... You know, it's just too bad because I'm already here 20 years in this country and I never got the chance to see you. We're waiting for oh, you. Oh, come, come and see us when we're playing. Well, well, I will, I will. It's kind of, you please know. Do, please <laughs> do, you'd be most welcome. We'd love to see you. Okay, uh, one more question. I, you know, I've seen so many documentaries about you and Sex Pistols. Could you tell me what yeah. was the kind of relationship between two of, two of bands of yours? Well, we had a good relationship at the start and then we got a little bit... It got a little bit bristly at the time of um. It was fine when we were like the second second band, and as soon as we started like doing our own moves and stuff, we got we started to fall apart uh, the relationship. But funnily enough, we got it back together again in the later years, and we've all been good friends since then. Well, so right then at the time, there's going to be a little bit of rivalry at that time, obviously, you know, mm -hmm. be a given, really. Yeah, that's, yeah. It, there's a new documentary about, I don't know if it's about you guys, or it, basically they, they advertise this as a documentary about Joe Strummer. You, have you seen oh, yeah, it? yeah, yeah, it's about John. <laughs> yeah. Have you seen it? Oh, yes, I'm in it. Yeah, I know, I know, I know, but hey, <laughs> what do you think about it? I thought it was good. It was very, very much like a three-part kind of story, like in the traditional sense, like uh -huh. the before, which I found particularly interesting. The during and the after were very three different sections. I found. But I thought it was really good. Good story. It kind of combined all the best of Julian's previous work as well. Well, uh -huh. think kind of. Like no, well, I have one more question, Nadwar, if I may. Sure. Because, uh, you know, what I heard about this film is just they, 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 they picture, maybe not you as a band, but St uh, Joe Strummer as, uh, as a guy who was hungry for fame. Is, 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 do you have this sense of him? Yeah, it was or? part of the picture, but no, I didn't really, reckon, I didn't really know that. Uh, not so much, you know. I mean, that's the kind of thing you might say afterwards, after the fact. So, sort of just this, this trying push. to embellish what it was. It wasn't that, actually. So is, it, is this only... more, it was something beyond that. It's so, more like kind of like um I don't know. Thank you very much for phoning in Hans and doot doot a loot do. Clash clash. And Mick, speaking of movies and stuff, you guys in Carbon Silicon have a song called Hey Charlie Chaplin. That's right. It's uh, yeah, called Charlie Chaplin. As I said before, I had a, like, I've just been in the lucky position of having a few young children the last few few years. My uh youngest daughter has just turned four and my uh, other one is five, so um, I felt a little bit like Charlie Chaplin. And both you and Tony were in the movie Ferris Bueller's Day Off. We weren't actually in the movie, we both had tracks on it. We both had tracks on the soundtrack of Ferris Bueller, and that's kind of a nice, kind of 80s 
thing to be on. And speaking of kids and whatnot, Mick Jones from Carbon Silicon, you also had some songs on the Flintstones soundtrack with Bad, right? Yeah, I've always loved the Flintstones and actually have all the actual, the whole, every Flintstones, because one day on the Cartoon Network, back in England, they showed a whole Flintstones marathon. It lasted about a week, and I managed to record every episode of the Flintstones onto video, including the Flintstones kids. So, obviously, I'm really into that. And, Mick, this was another thing that I was going to show you, another photo, but unfortunately, I guess you didn't make it to Vancouver. You will return. This was a photo I had of Ray Winstone and Paul Simonon sitting on a movie set in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. That's right. That's right. They made this film called Ladies and Gentlemen, The Fabulous Stains. And that was when we were making San I think, and Paul went off for a few weeks to make that movie with Steve Jones and Paul Cook and Ray. And then they they played this band called Fabulous Stains. And then there was, like, all the girls, like, kind of, like... It was from the same woman who wrote Slap Shots, you know, the movie with Paul Newman, Nancy Dowd. Yes, indeed. Anyway, yeah. And what... Yeah, it was a good, kind of interesting movie that, that's, like, no one gets to see. And it's very interesting because one of the groups in that... Um, wear some white smock or something. No, they wear white stripes, and they go, ladies and gentlemen, here's the white stripes. Right? And that was the first time you ever heard that. It was also in that movie. And Paul actually... So it was a very interesting movie. And that was shot in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Another connection. But did Paul miss some of the Sandinista sessions as a result of that? Because he told... That was right, yeah. Like, he, 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 you had actually finished everything, and then he had to go and actually fill in, so he actually missed some of the sessions for that movie, which is quite... That's good. right. I saw on some clips that you had posted from the Carbon Casino that you guys did a version of Should I Stay or Should I Go with, by The Clash, and you'd also perform that with the Libertines. What's the difference between the Libertines version of Should I Stay or Should I Go and the Carbon Silicon version of Should I Stay well, or Should I Go? Uh, the difference is that when we played it with, um, when we played it, we played it with Topper. Um, it was the first time I played with Topper for about 25 years. So that was really amazing. You know, Topper was a drummer from The Clash, and so that was why we did it. And when I did it with the Libertines, it was like, it was with Gary Powell. My good friend... He's also good as well. He's a drummer of the Libertines. <laughs> My good friend Dave, he's originally from Dover, and he was always told that the headmaster of his school was Topper Heaton's dad. Is that true? Was Top that is true. That is true. Topper's dad is a headmaster, and that is exactly true. And Topper lives in Dover now, even now. So and he's gone back. That's where he was, was originally from. And my friends, my friend was saying, his dad was telling my friend that, it, that his friends were saying, yeah, just go over to Topper's house, he'd love to see you. You know, he's into jamming. Is Topper into jamming like that? He, he really is, you know what I mean? And he's also, he, um, he's doing really well now. Doing really well. Mick, speaking of rock, right. rock and Roll Public Library, the London SS, I began the Nardwar to Human Serviette radio show by playing a track by The Boys, the legendary punk band The Boys. Yeah, and we sort of played with them uh, in that time, you know, that was one of the groups we played with. We met with lots of musicians during that time, although the group itself never played a gig or recorded anything. No, the London... Or anything like that. It was just really a conduit for meeting other musicians at the time. And it was never going to work anyway. I noticed you had some different names. For instance, you were called the London SS, but when Chrissy Hind joined the band, I saw that there were some proposed names with Chrissy Hind, like schoolgirl yeah. underwear, Mike. The, the idea behind discharge. that when we had Chrissy Hind was that she was going to be like just one of the boys, right? Not the boys, the band, but just one of the boys. And she, you think she was a boy, and we were going to do this band called Schoolgirls Undies, and then she was going to be the lead singer. And then when we made it. She would go, ta-da, I'm a girl. And that was the idea. You, you anyway, so obviously it didn't work, but that was the original idea of it, and that was Girl Girl Undies. And, and then I think Chrissy went on to join the Moors Murderers after that and, for a short while before she formed the Pretenders. And Mick Jones, you also had Terry Chimes, who later formed, you know, with, helped you with The Clash and also was, did stuff with Tony in some playing as well, I think, and also... Yeah, had, no. And then, but he's a, he's a really famous chiropractic guru now. That's so right. He's always 
he always wanted to be a doc, some kind of doctor. He didn't really want... He wanted to play drums, but only, like... And he's a wonderful guy, and we're really great friends with him, too, now. And it's funny that he's played with both Tony and I. And, of course, he did two stints of The Clash. One, the early played in the first record, and then rejoined later after Tuffer left. Yes, I think he's actually pictured in that photo from 1982 at Carisdale Arena. Okay, that would be right. And earlier today, believe it or not, Mick Jones, I did an interview with Flavor Flav from Public Enemy, who I think sampled Big Audio Dynamite. Did Public Really? I love Flavor of Love, got to say. We watch that every night. Uh, we watch the repeats. What's going to happen with Thing 1 and Thing 2? I'm not sure. He's shooting a sitcom in Vancouver. <laughs> He's shooting a sitcom. No more reality shows for him. He's shooting an actual sitcom. Why doesn't, or not a lot I care, but why doesn't MTV or VH1 have a videos anymore? <laughs> I, I'm not, I guess... It's a reality show after reality show, isn't it? I, they do sometimes show when you're asleep. But I, I think they have YouTube. The odd video. They have YouTube instead, and people can actually check out so much of your stuff on the internet. And isn't that amazing? Isn't YouTube amazing for everybody? Isn't it great? You can go, like, just look at the MC5 or the Stooges or the Dolls on YouTube. Caller, are you there? I am here. Go ahead. Um, speak up, caller, to Mick Jones to from Carbon Silicon. Okay. All right. Hi, Mick. Hello. Long-time fan of The Clash and Big Audio Dynamite. Thank you very much. I'm going to the Bermuda Triangle of Signal Zones down here in... Uh, oh, right. well, don't get lost. I hope I don't cut <laughs> out, but um, you've been an inspiration to me, man. I uh, I learned Spanish Bombs as one of the first songs ever on guitar when oh, I first nice picked one, one up. And, uh, yeah, so I just wanted to call and say hi, and uh, you're a living legend. Thank you very much. Very nice of you. Well, so I was hoping you could say hi to my wife. She's driving home right now. Her name is Michaela. Michaela. Hi, Michaela. Listen, drive safely, darling, and take it easy. Well, thanks, well, thanks very much, caller, and do do the loot do. Do do. There you are, Mick. You're helping with people on their drive homes in rush hour. I know. I'm trying to tell them to drive safely, and now I'm, I should be like the guy, the green cross coat guy. Carbon Silicon have a song called Yes, I Can. And speaking of, right. speaking of Yes, I Can, is it true that Joe Strummer ran marathons? He was a r marathon runner? Did you he ever did, run? He did, he did. He didn't do training, but he did do the running of the marathons. He ran first the Paris Marathon, right, when he did a runner from the band, right? And then after that, when, when we, we hooked him, we brought him back, right? And then he ran the London Marathon. And uh, I think he might have done a couple of them, but he did no training. But they went, I'm doing the whole thing, and he did. Oh my and god! Then, that's the kind of guy he was. Seriously. Caller, are you there? And he did it. And he did it for charity. Hey, hello. Caller, go ahead to Mick Jones from Carbon Silicon. Hi. Hi, and hardware. Yes, go ahead, caller. It's Chad Allen here. Oh, hello, Chad. Believe it or not, Mick, this is an amazing well, moment. We were just this, Fantastic. This is Chad Allen, the original lead singer of the Guess Who, speaking Chad to Allen's on. speaking to Mick Jones, singer of the legendary rock and roll band The Clash, Big Audio Dynamite, and Carbon Silicon. That's who you're speaking Amazing. to. Amazing. Mick Jones. Should we do Shaking All Over? Yeah, Johnny Kidd and the Pirates. And now, Chad, could you explain to Mick Jones, because when I said to Mick Jones, I'm going to be doing an interview with Chad Allen from the Guess Who, I said the author of the song, Shaking All Over, he said Johnny Kidd and the Pirates. How did, could you explain to Mick, it, it was a hit here, wasn't it, Chad? Yeah, well, he's right, actually. Uh, Johnny Kidd, um, I actually wrote, I'm trying to think of his, uh, Fred Heath, his real name was Fred Heath, who's deceased That's now, right. actually, and uh, he actually wrote the song. He was famous because he had an eye patch as well. That's which right, he had a pirate outfit. That's right. But Nick Green was a fam famous gu the guitarist of the Pirates, and he was a very great guitarist as well. So oh, He was great, indeed. Oh, yeah, I've got uh, stuff on tape here and records, and yeah, I lo love Johnny Kidd. Well, Me too. Do you know the track Ecstasy? 
We oh. used to, to cover that one, the Ecstasy. It's like the B-side of one of the, the singles or something, maybe, but it's like, it's called Ecstasy, and it's like, it goes, da 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 Ecstasy. Oh, I don't it's think a really I, cool tune. Don't think I've I'm sure that you one, probably but... know it. Which mm-hmm. songs did you cover, Chad, in the Guess Who? You did a couple Johnny Kidd numbers, didn't you? Well, we did, I uh, forget, oh, the title of the... Um, baby Feeling? Uh, baby Feeling, you do it to me, baby, you do it all the time. Uh, yeah, I like this. I like that we're singing them now as well. Isn't that great on the radio now? You know oh, what I mean? yeah. They'll, he'll get the records out soon and play them and everybody will know them again. Well, this is a momentous occasion, Mick. I'm not joking. You were speaking <laughs> right there, too. That is Chad Allen. Chad, you really are Chad Allen, aren't you, Chad? Well, yes, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm quite honest. All right, Chad. Nice to talk to you. Nice to meet you, man. And nice to talk to you. work. And uh, keep on rocking in the free world, Chad. And do 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 loot do Dun, dun. Wasn't that amazing, Mick? That was Chad Allen, the original lead singer. Oh, I know. The, what a great interview this has turned out. <laughs> of the Guess Who, linking up with you, Mick Jones. I, <laughs> I, I, it's, just, it's incredible, because, yeah, Chad, it, seriously, it was the singer of the Guess Who, and then, of course, he left, and then Burton Cummins took over. They had 18 records out, 18 records out before they had a hit. 18 records. Amazing. That's a, that shows character. And speaking of long hair, etc., is it true that Don Letts has never cut his hair in like 30 years? He hasn't cut his hair? Is that true, Don Letts? I don't Letts? know. Oh, I've got Leo sitting with me, and he's, a very, he's, a, he's also a rasta. And so, um, is it true that Don has never cut his hair? Or he, Don has never cut his hair? Have you cut yours? Yeah. You cut it, trimmed it a little bit. But it's like so long, your locks, both of those guys. Don has never cut his hair. But it's like, so, they're both so long, the locks are just like down there now. It's like when you get older, it just grows. I mentioned Flavor Flav, Mick Jones. Grandmaster Flash, you had Grandmaster Flash open for the Clash in New York City years ago. Is it true he was bottled off the stage? Was he really bottled off the stage? He wasn't really bottled off, but they didn't get the, the, the uh, reception that we'd hoped he did, that's for sure. He got barracked somewhat. They were... Uh, they weren't open as open as we uh, we hope. We saw our fans as much more open minded, and then Joe came on and got told everybody off pretty much. You know what I mean? Like you've got to give these people a chance and stuff. But now, now look at it. But we we love Flash, yeah. I mentioned earlier a bit about bands that are happening now. For instance, Lily Allen was kind of the big thing a couple years ago. I don't know too much about Keith Allen. What can you tell to people, people about Keith Allen, Lily Allen's father? Are you aware of Well, Keith yeah, he's an old friend of ours. An old friend of ours, a great friend of Joe's of mine. Um, when we first met him, he's, a very, he's quite a well-known actor in England now, but when we first met him, he was at... He was like the manager of this like kind of variety act called Peter Singh, the Sikh Elvis, and he was like the manager of this. And he, they were playing with the Clash with us, and, and he came on. He was a Sikh guy, and he come and did the whole the El, late Elvis shtick, the whole thing. And so he was the manager of that. He's worked himself up. His brother is quite a well-known director who directed that film Twin Towns. You know, the first film that Reese Siffins made, but. Um, Keith is a very well-known and much-liked actor back at home who plays in the... He's like the sheriff of Nottingham in the new Robin Hood. The recordings that you did for your new release, Carbon Silicon, the Carbon Silicon, the last... Yes. The last post. The last post, What was yeah. the environment like? Because when you recorded London Calling with Guy Stevens, he was throwing around a lot of chairs. What was the difference between the chair throwing of Guy Stevens versus a recording of Carbon Silicon, the last post? Well, uh, I think Guy was a fantastic catalyst for us, you know what I mean? Oh, even though his methods may have seemed a little bit um, unusual, but nonetheless, he seemed to get something out of the group that um, that actually I took on in my production when I started producing. My main inspiration as a producer would be like Guy Stevens, who whose main inspiration would have been Phil Spector or something, but it's actually to do with uh, not only... Well, mostly to do with being in the moment, you in the studio, making that moment happen, but also knowing all the stuff that led you to be that moment and all the stuff that inspired you to be in that moment. 
Caller, are you... i to bring all that out. In a, Caller, are in you there? Bit. Yes, I am. Caller, go ahead to Mick Jones from Carbon Silicon. Hi, Mick. This is a complete honor to speak to you. All right, nice to speak to you, too. Hi. I actually saw you guys live in 1982 at uh, the Carisdale Arena here in Vancouver. Uh, oh, cool. On that rock tour. It was fantastic. Sure. But I have a question for you. Yeah, of course. Just wondering if, if you and Joe had any plans of reuniting the Clash prior to his untimely death a few years back. <coughs> well, it, it seemed like it. we wanted to because we were going to... Uh, we were talking about the uh, being inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and that was just coming up, and we were talking about it, and we, uh, I was pretty much up for it, and so was Joe, and then Paul wasn't that much up for it, and we were, we were going to try, and, we talked about trying to figure out a way of trying to persuade him in some way or another, you know, twist his arm. Yep. Fantastic. We thought Chinese, we thought Chinese waterboarding might work. I'm watching you guys right now on YouTube, uh, White Riot Live, 1978, Victoria Park, London. All right. Yeah, it's fantastic. Anyway, thanks for the music. You guys are, are the best, and uh, like I said, it was a real honor talking to you. Thank you very Thank you, much. Call Actually, it's been my pleasure. Thank, Thank you, caller, and do 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 Clash rules. In that clip that the caller was talking about, Jimmy Percy is singing for you. Speaking of other punk bands, etc., did you ever do any gigs with Crass? What did you think about Crass, the punk band Crass? Crass, Crass. No, we didn't do any gigs with them. They didn't like us very much, I think, because they were kind of like a bit jealous or something. But they went on to do Chumba Wumba, a lot of those guys. And uh, they poured an ice bucket over John Prescott, who was Deputy Press Prime Minister at the Brits Award, famously for that, and didn't do very much after it. Another caller asked a little while back, Hans, about your relationship with the Sex Pistols. When I think of the Sex Pistols, of course, I think of Johnny Rotten. And then I think of Public Image <coughs> Limited. And then I think that the first drummer of Pill, Jim Walker, is Canadian. He was from Vancouver. Do you remember? Oh, right. That's right. Yeah. Do, do you remember Jim Walker from Vancouver? Because when you think about it, here's a kid. He grows up in Vancouver. He moves to England, and he ends up joining Johnny Rotten's band. What do you remember about what, Jim Walker? What, from that must have been wild. That, what, that must have been like. I only knew him very vaguely, briefly, but I do know Keith Levine, who was the first guitarist, used to be our guitarist in The Clash, but we had too many guitarists. And so he worked out that it just happened that he left. And then he joined them group, that group. <laughs> so we have, took him for a drink. Do you have any memories of Jim Walker? I was just curious. Do you remember him at all? Have you ever seen him around? Or do you remember I, the... I haven't seen him for a long time. I, I, knew, I knew him to say hello to him in those days. You know, that was it. Do you know many Canadians at all, Mick Jones, over the years? Have you? I do. I have a really great friend who's a Canadian. His name is John Leonard. And he's a saxophone player, and he played with Spear of Destiny first. And then he went on to play also with, uh, no, he played with Theatre of Hate first, and then went on to play with Spear of Destiny. And also he was like a, a North American squash champion, John Boy. And so we were so very much liked him, and we we're still our friends today. He's an artist and still continues to be a musician. And he's in Toronto. You've been working with Tony all these years from the London SS. You even yes, well, we've been friends all these years. We haven't been working together. We've been obviously in our own groups, but now we're working again together. But in a way, weren't you helping or working with Sig Sig Sputnik? Didn't you used to buy? Right. Didn't you used to buy Sig Nick, Sig Sig Sputnik synthesizers? Weren't you on the road? You'd buy. Oh, I, I did. What I did is I mixed the sound for their very first gigs. I was like their out front sound guy. Right, it was just like, uh, we were both like, we started those, those groups to sort of at the same time, we were still great friends, and Tony started Sputnik and I started BAD, and we sort of came up at the same time together, and we were the only groups that were using, like, about, you know, like, samples and all that stuff, we were like, one of the first groups that used it, before there was companies and stuff that, copyright companies like it's now today, forget about it. And you are Mick Jones of The Clash. Well, thanks so much for phoning into the Nardwater Human Serviette radio show, Mick Jones. Of course, it's been my pleasure. Lovely talking to you. Oh, really appreciate it. And lastly, I just wanted to ask you one last question. Peter Whitehead, speaking of films, you got Peter Whitehead to film one of your gigs, and I saw a movie that Peter Whitehead did about London and the Pink Floyd. Having Peter well, Whitehead... an amazing film called Tonight Let's All Make Love in London, which is a 60s iconic. Peter shot all like, the first... Um, all the stuff for immediate label, Andrew Lou Goldham, all the first Stones promo films, 
uh, Small Faces. He shot the first ever film of Pink Floyd, um, Led Zeppelin at the Bath Music Festival before they'd even debuted in London. That really incredible underground avant-garde filmmaker. He filmed Alan Ginsberg and the Poets in 63 at the Albert Hall. He's like a really um, important figure in underground filmmaking, counterculture figure, you know. And he filmed you guys. Will that film be available? When can we see that film? What did he film? Well, he filmed uh, like some stuff we in the early to earlier, like a couple of years ago in Carbon Silicon. We still continue to be friends and stuff, but I want to, you know, be trying to help him to put his films out. You know, more than anything, really. But our, all our stuff is available everywhere on the internet for free, so just forget about it. You have whatever you like. Carbonsilicon.com. And thanks for phoning to Nerdwriter Human Serviette Radio Show. Anything else you want to say to the people out there at all? Mick Jones from Carbon Silicon. Um, just, like, just try and take care of yourself and uh, drive safely and um, try and uh, be positive about things. Have a nice time. Keep on rocking in the free world and do... Thanks, man. Do, 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 do. Lots of love, everybody. Almost, Mick Jones. Do, 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 do. Do, do.